Today, we're thrilled to have with us five reporters to talk about one of the most challenging beats in Washington. George Condon, one of our guests, is a White House correspondent for National Journal and a former president of the White House Correspondents Association. He's been on the beat almost 40 years. Francesca Chambers is a White House correspondent for McClatchy and a current board member of the WHCA. Anita Kumar is a White House correspondent and an associate editor for Politico and current WHCA secretary. Paula Reed is a White House correspondent for CBS News, where she also maintains a focus on legal issues. And Margaret Taleb is a political and White House editor for Axios, a CNN political analyst, and a former president of the White House Correspondents Association. I have some questions and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. You can raise your Zoom hand or put a question into the Q&A text function. We're gonna work in as many questions as we can. And please tweet today at hashtag NPF White House. So welcome all. I wanna thank you all for joining in. Um, uh, for the viewers out there, you know, raise your hands and I'll work in your questions or put in, the, uh, put in a question in the text function. But for now, I'm gonna start with George Condon. George, you've been on the beat the longest, as I said, back to 1982 and President Ronald Reagan. You even covered a bit of Nixon, Ford and Carter from a, from a distance, I guess. So big picture, tell us what are the most important differences during the past four years kind of compared with what was going on during the previous five administrations before Trump? I mean, how has big picture, how has the press operations changed? Sure, well, you're probably gonna think I'm gonna say that it's because uh, of the constant attacks uh, from President Trump and his people. Uh, and that's not it. Uh, it is true, they went to, an extreme that no other president had in calling us an enemy of the people. Uh, but, you know, no president has liked this. Uh, George H.W. Bush uh, used to wear a cap that said, annoy the media, reelect Bush. Uh, but my biggest difference is a very small, seemingly a small thing. And that's a willingness to answer questions, uh, basic questions. Uh, I have never encountered a White House before where they don't answer uh, basic questions. They don't understand the difference between spin and policy, that sometimes we just wanna know what is the policy gonna cost? What people is it gonna affect? Uh, and they aren't, uh, in, instead of getting that answer, you often get uh, an email back or a response that reads like a campaign document. President Trump is, uh, is putting America first and that behind all his policies. Well, that's nice, but it doesn't come close to answering the question. And the second thing is they aren't particularly well informed. Uh, in August, when uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, John Hume in uh, Ireland died, uh, who had worked with three or four American presidents on peace in, in Ireland, uh, I asked an aide, I said, I didn't see it. Did the president tweet or, uh, or put out a statement on John Hume's death? And the response I got was, who is that? It had only been on page one of the New York Times that day, but they, they just don't answer questions. Well, they cut their subscription to the Times though, didn't they? Well, they all say they do that. Yeah, okay. Well, tell me, um, let me just go to, let me go to Margaret for this one. Um, can you give us a sense? I mean, how did it change within? How did it change within the administration in terms of openness and the willingness to answer the basic questions? There's been three press secretaries during this time. You know, have they all operated the same, or they do they? Does it vary by who happens to be in the press secretary seat? Thanks, uh, Chris, and thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be joined by all my colleagues here. So I do think that there uh, was a change over the course of the four years. And if you had to pick a turning point, it would be impeachment. Um, but uh, from the beginning, uh, from the opening uh, day, full day of the presidency with the um, president's performance at the Wall of Stars and then the hubbub in the press room um, uh, with the kind of argument over crowd size, uh, you could see that you were going to be engaging with the White House uh, that was going to have um, an imperative 
to kind of to, to play to audience number one, which was the president, right? Uh, in addition to uh, serving as a, uh, a pipeline for communications between the White House and the press and the public. And President Trump, I think uh, more than any uh, president in, in any of our coverage spans, maybe even Georgia's, um, ha has a unique uh, kind of um, obsession with television coverage uh, with the media and, um, whether you are a fan or not, uh, whether you feel that he's used it for good uh, or not, uh, a, a, an uncanny ability to pull the levers of modern media, uh, whether it's the filter media or whether it's social media. And so I think that obviously to some degree uh, must have guided the thinking of various folks inside the White House communications arm. Uh, but also I think uh, the trajectory of his presidency, the challenges that he faced and, uh, and from the moment that uh, that he was under the spotlight of the impeachment proceedings, the cover, the ability to cover that White House and uh, the posture of that White House uh, changed even more than um, than it had been from the outset. Okay, well, let me go to Paula for a second. Um, Margaret mentioned the, you know, the role uh, President Trump's, you know, background and 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 role with with TV. You're the you're the TV person on our panel here. Um, and you also have a lot of experience covering coloring the Mueller, Mueller investigation. You used to cover or cover justice, and so you have a, you know keen insight onto the political or the legal issues. I mean, did the fact that you were on TV did that? What kind of access or different kind of access did that give you compared with with print folks? Uh, you know, one funny story about President Trump that jumps to mind is sometimes we'll all go in for for a pool spray. And I'd never seen this before. He would direct the camera and the cuts camera. He would say, actually, that's not a good angle. Could you go down to the end of the table? And it was just remarkable because then the cameraman was like, what do I do? I can't let him dictate uh, our coverage. So he's definitely uh, the producer uh, in chief. Look, he does sometimes um, gravitate uh, towards uh, the TV people that he recognizes but just because he recognizes you doesn't mean he wants to talk to you, right? He also gets very upset uh, sometimes if he sees you reporting unfavorably on television and you can be um, sort of ostracized. We've also seen, I think one of the biggest differences during COVID is those briefings were watched by a lot of people. We've all questioned him um, out, out by the helicopters. We've all fact checked him, maybe had some contentious exchanges, but suddenly during the COVID briefings, there was a cuts camera. And that's where I think the TV element of things really changed because um, I think the president uh, was at times more belligerent, uh, trying to attack uh, and undermine the credibility uh, of the questioner and, and the questions. And people sort of got to see those exchanges uh, from both sides, which, which changed things quite a bit. But look, as a TV person, one thing I'll say is I'd always rather hear from the principal, be it uh, the attorney general or the president, and we would see President Trump on camera probably on average every other day. Our Mark Noller has the stats and he says he held more press of, on camera uh, press availabilities uh, than certainly his, his, his predecessors. And that as a television person, yes, that made my job uh, easier and it made it easier for him to get his message out. But it was our job to put his message in context and to challenge uh, some of the things he said during those availabilities. I mean, during those availabilities, are, are, as, as you noted, there have been a lot more of them with this president. Are they, I mean, how do you, how do you balance the, the access versus the actual, you know, the knowledge of the value from those availabilities? I mean, if he's giving you, if he's giving you bad information on balance, is it, is it good for your viewers or not? Well, even if there's, we all know, even if there's nothing on the schedule, be prepared for uh, something to open up at any minute, every day you go in and you have your questions and you don't just have your first question, you have your follow, your follow to that, your follow to that. Um, President Trump, uh, his communication style lends itself to shorter shorter questions, um, but you have to have the follow-up and you have to have your fact check. Uh, and that's the challenge for us. Uh, if he said something that was not true, uh, to fact check that, or if it was a personal attack, don't engage, just go to your next question. Try to get the facts if you can, but preparation and, and the reporting before the encounter is key. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit, I want to go forward a little bit, and then we'll kind of, uh, to, to the Biden administration, then we'll kind of come back and talk about, I want to talk about, I want to talk about Twitter, I want to talk about bias, I want to talk about leaks and other kinds of access, but we'll get to all those questions. Um, but Anita, I want to go to you first for, I mean, do you have a sense yet about 
what the Biden administration's press shop is going to be like. And do we know, is it going to be like, you know, Obama term three, or is it going to be something kind of unique to him? Do we have that sense yet? Well, I think we're starting to get a sense of that um, for a couple reasons. One, we've seen what he was like and what his team was like during the campaign and now during the transition. And it's very um, controlled. It's very disciplined. Um, they have a message they want to get out and they're getting it out and, and really not deviating from that. So if you ask a question that's not on the topic, they just don't really, they're very nice and polite about it, but they're not going to answer that um, they just don't want to do that. So in that way, it's very much like Obama was. I thought they were very similar. They are very similar. And the, one of the other reasons for that is because there are a lot of Obama people in, um, you know, Biden's orbit. We've seen, you know, the new incoming press secretary work for Barack Obama, Jen Psaki. So we're going to see a lot of those similarities. I think they're also trying to show that they're taking coronavirus much more seriously. So you've seen small events, small press availabilities, small speeches. Um, there's just not that many people around and we don't really know what that's gonna like, look like when they go to the White House. So I think they are taking a page from the Obama playbook. Um, and I think that they're also just showing that Joe Biden is kind of a disciplined um, you know, strategist in terms of media. So we'll see what this looks like. Okay. And um, let me go to Francesca here. You, you, uh, Anita mentioned COVID and um, Francesca, I was hoping you could give a sense for, for the viewers, some of whom are journalists and some of whom aren't journalists. Give us a sense how you all have operated, you know, since March under COVID in terms of, I mean, how do you, how do you, how often are you getting into the White House? How often are you, you know, having close access with people? How are you, how are you doing your jobs? And do you have a sense how much that is going to change under Biden? Well, following up on Anita's point, it is, difficult to say at this point how some of those things will look because because partially of the pandemic right we we, we don't know uh moving forward how how that access will look like uh, completely yet and particularly after the the, the pandemic uh, after we can start increasing the amount of journalists who would be in the room again as far as is what it's looked like for me in the in this time during the pandemic certainly before i was there almost every single day at the white house you could just walk up to senior officials after their gathering on the driveway, which, by the way, is a was a very different thing that we saw under the Trump administration, where you would have senior officials who, after they were on television, would speak to groups of reporters right out on the driveway. And so we were able to get their thinking on things sometimes in, in real time. But the number of journalists who are there every day has decreased because of COVID, because it is not safe for large groups to be gathering in close quarters in, in a building, even if they're wearing masks. And so that has made it in some ways more difficult as a reporter, uh, because then this speaks a little bit more to, to George's point. It, we all know that it's not uh, as easy to get an answer when you're trying to email people. They cannot respond to your calls as well. It's much easier to ask them about those things face to face. But I did want to touch on something else that you said before we move on. Uh, and that is about a way that I've seen this, you know, this administration change. Paula talked about the, the, the access that we've had to President Trump. A large reason for that, though, has been frequently that press secretaries have not always known what the president's thinking is on matters and even his own senior officials. And we have had to distinguish between whether it's a person's personal opinion or if it's the opinion of the White House or if it's the opinion of the president frequently, because those are not always the same. And this president has, is, is known for taking the advice of, of different officials and then deciding which of those he wants to go with. So what we have often seen is them just waiting to put the president on camera so we can ask questions of him because they they often just don't know the answer. And uh, if they do offer one, then he sometimes in a one of those pool sprays will just contradict them even minutes later or even uh, minutes later in tweets. Right. So is it I mean, tell me a little bit about the access. I mean, and compare it with, um, you know, compare it with the Biden or I'm sorry, the Obama administration. I mean, how how easy is it to get to get people within the White House to, to, to meet with you, to give you, get a call back, you know, on a background basis. Um, I mean, is, you know, you know, I know that the Trump, administ Trump administration, Trump White House is very leaky. Is it as leaky as they come? I mean, how does it compare? Well, and 
I will also say this, I covered the last two years of the Obama administration. I was certainly not doing the exact same kind of White House reporting that I'm doing now. And, you know, George and maybe Margaret, even Anita might be able to speak to this a little bit more because certainly once you're a seasoned White House reporter, uh, then, then it's easier, right, to get those senior officials on, on the phone, maybe more so than when you're just starting out. And so I'm, I'm fortunate that at the end of the four years here, I'm in a much different spot for, for the Trump administration even than when I was at the beginning, because certainly trying to cover an administration at the beginning during a pandemic would have been very difficult. And to your point before, that's the difficulty we're facing in a Biden administration. If you, if you cannot be on the property all the time because of COVID restrictions, and if you, you, you don't have access to the, to the White House chief of staff that's incoming, right? How do you uh, get in touch with those people? How do you get the information you need and what assistance do they provide? All right. Okay. Well, tell, I'd like to go around the room here to get a, get a, to ask about that question on access. I mean, Paul, you and I were talking about that yesterday. I mean, how, you know, this is a leaky White House. I mean, you know, it's also a news-filled White House, a chaotic White House, you know, which makes, makes for lots of news for y'all to cover. Are you going to, are you going to miss the leakiness? If, <laughs> if, if the next administration is a little more disciplined than, than this one has been, are you going to miss that? Well, of course, I, I, I certainly don't miss the heavy reliance on the press office that I had certainly covering the Justice Department under the Obama administration, because now, as Francesca mentioned, often the press office doesn't necessarily know what the president's going to do uh, or what he's thinking. Uh, the president's uh, administration has been a lawyer, full employment act. There's always an attorney uh, to, to talk to about something for me. Uh, that's been very helpful. And yeah, there's a lot of people too who don't necessarily agree with the, uh, with the administration or want to defend the president and are willing to talk. So because there is so much chaos, there's just seemingly an inability to stay on one consistent message. It has been a lot easier to develop sources uh, and get people to, to really talk to you. I mean, there have been instances where they've had an official briefing, something they're, they're pushing out. And while that briefing is going on, we weren't invited to this particular one. I was able to talk to, I think it was Dr. Fauci, just like blew up the official message. Uh, so that's really been something that's remarkable and unique. And I do not expect uh, that to continue. I think there is an expectation that they will kind of all um, circle the wagons and, and really be more consistent about their message. But that's a challenge for us uh, to try to get around, around the official messaging. I mean, Anita, how, you know, d describe for me the, the you know, the level of access and leaks and off the record conversations from Obama to Trump. And did the Trump spigot, did it kind of turn on right at the start or did it, has it changed a lot over the four years? Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a huge difference, as Paula said. I mean, just a big, big difference. I mean, there are a lot of people to talk to their former officials. And as we know, there's been a record number of people coming and going turnover. So there's a lot of people that have been in the room or been involved. And so you can always find them, but there is a negative to that, even though more people are talking to you. President Trump is very different in that. Well, he's different in a lot of ways, but he's different in that you can talk to someone who's spoken to him, um, multiple people who have spoken to been been in the room and he can change his mind. So if you're trying to report on something that he's going to do or someone he's going to name, and you think you have that down because you've talked to three people who know that information, he can change his mind. It doesn't mean that it was wrong. Um, he was thinking that he was gonna do something. He changed his mind. Um, so that happens a lot. And it's actually changed a little bit in how we write stories and that you can't really say he's expected to do something, you can, I guess, if you have that big caveat that he changes his mind at a moment's notice that it could change. So, I mean, while it's helpful and I'm glad to have all these extra sources, I do think that they're just because of President Trump's, you know, personality and how he does this, there is some, you know, negative to talking to so many people. You think you've got something or know something and it's really not and really not true. So, but I will, of course, miss miss some of those, uh, you know, people uh, when when President Elect Biden comes in. You know, my experience was maybe a little bit different than others. So, I'll I'll be interested to see what other people say about how it's changed over time. I think it. I know that some people thought it was leaky from the beginning, but for me, I covered Hillary Clinton in 2016. So I can't, thought, like most of America, that she was going to win, and I knew all these people and had all these sources and. Um, 
was feeling good about knowing some people. And of course, then Donald Trump won. And so I walked in not knowing anyone. Um, you know, one thing I will remember forever is that I was the pool reporter, which means I was in the room when President Obama and, and then President-elect Donald Trump met for that first time in the Oval Office. And I remember being with other reporters standing, waiting to go into the Oval Office and literally someone had to point out who Jared Kushner was. That's how focused I was on Hillary Clinton. So for me, it's gotten better over time, but I think that's because I didn't know people going in. Okay. Um, well, Mario, what, so what do you, th you know, the level of the level of leaks and how is that, how that has changed? I mean, any, any thoughts that you have about what the next administration might be like that, on that or how Trump has changed? I'm smiling because one thing that I've been struck by listening to my colleagues talk for the last few minutes is how many times people have talked about Joe Biden as um, the epitome of message discipline because <laughs> George is laughing too. Anyone who's covered um, President-elect Biden over a period of years or decades knows that he's like, God bless him, as his mother would say, completely undisciplined. But, uh, but compared but, to Trump. <laughs> right, but it's all relative. And I think the difference is not the principal's message discipline, although Biden is more disciplined than Trump when it comes to policy discussions, uh, but it is the uh, the staff's message discipline and it, not just the discipline, but the kind of the grounding and the parameters and the driving you know, motivations of these folks. And so I think um, you've asked a couple of questions. Let me try to touch on them. Uh, leaks. Yes, obviously there are uh, a ton more true leaks inside uh, the Trump administration than there ever were inside the uh, Obama-Biden White House. And then I think most, ex most of us would expect to see in the Biden-Harris uh, White House. Um, there, are, there have been a number of controlled leaks out of the um, Biden-Harris shop already and a couple of uncontrolled ones and folks got taken to task about that some bad feelings inside uh the chc and the cbc well people finding out through public reporting that their person was no longer the front runner for xyz so that's you know there's a little bit of leakage in every um transition team or at every administration but uh leak as uh leak as sport leak as expectation and leak as a form of self-preservation i don't think it's going to approximate what we've seen in the last four years with the incoming administration. Um, there are kind of a couple ways that I think about this. And one is that um, most traditional politicians, regardless of whether they're Republicans or Democrats or where on the spectrum of their parties they are, um, if you're like a traditional politician or if you are a staffer for a traditional politician, you care a lot about legacy, about tradition, about being a building block for your party in the years to come, about how you will be remembered um, by um, institutions, uh, whether they're the history books or colleges or the Congress or the Senate or your predecessors, how you will fit into the president's club, um, where you'll take the country. And I think uh, President Trump and the bulk uh, of his inner circle did not come from that framework when they came to office. Um, they came from a much different mentality. They, uh, uh, the institutional audience they were aiming for was uh, the American public and not just the American public at large, but kind of the base, uh, which um, I think it's shorthand to describe every Trump voter as disenfranchised. I don't think that's uh, or you know, uh, if feeling alienated by the country. I don't think that's accurate, but I think for, uh, for a sizable percentage of the base, that was an element of it. And uh, that is, um, you, are, you have a different goal in mind. You are aiming for something different. You are not bound by uh, kind of the covenants of traditional politics. I think from a reporter's perspective, most reporters come to White House reporting from one of two tracks. They either come from the policy track, they covered campaigns, and then they learn about policy while they're covering the White House, or they're policy reporters who come to the White House and have to understand how politics blows up every policy decision. Uh, but if you are, um, but if your interest or your love or, or your expertise is policy reporting, Policy reporting in the Trump years has been very difficult uh, because it ha has been so guided by politics. And uh, so often the people running the policy shops were not steeped in, in policy, they were steeped in politics. I think with the incoming administration, 
in part because we've known so many of these players in different venues for many years, and in part just because of the principal himself, because of who President-elect Biden is, you are going to see a return to more of a focus on policy and consistency and policy making. And I think that's going to guide a lot of the coverage. Okay. And um, before I go to uh, George right now, I want to say, Margaret, you have a remarkably well-behaved dog over your right shoulder there. What's the dog's uh, name? Anna Bear appreciates the compliment. Thank you. Okay. Very, very well behaved. Uh, George, let me go to you, you, you. The next press secretary, if my math is right, will be your 20th. Um, going back to 1982. So tell our, tell our listeners here, you know, outside of just standing up at the podium and, and handling questions during the briefing, I mean, what does the press secretary do in terms of, of running the press shop? And, how, and what is a good press secretary? I mean, who has been a good press secretary out of those, those 19 that you've so far dealt with? Okay, well, well you know, Mike McCurry always, uh, who, who was with Clinton, always described the geography of it. His office is equidistant between the briefing room serving the press and the Oval Office serving the president. And a good press secretary understands that tug and that pull and works for the president, but tries to also recognize works for the American people and we're the representatives uh, there. Uh, as far as the good ones, there were three that I really put on a, uh, on a separate tier. And that's uh, Marlon Fitzwater with Reagan and Bush, McCurry with Clinton. And, and I did add Josh Ernest to that. And it's three people who could talk about policy, who understood what we do for a living uh, and, and what our role is uh, and, and, and tried to understand uh, that and, and answer questions. Uh, the worst one, uh, was Larry Speaks with Reagan, uh, because the very first thing we look for from a press secretary is tell the truth. And, and Speaks famously, we were all in Geneva for the uh, Reagan Gorbachev summit. This was a big deal. First time, su first superpower summit in six years, first time Gorbachev was on the world stage. And we're all there hanging on every word after the first meeting, Larry Speaks came out and gave us word for word what Reagan had said to Gorbachev. We all reported that. It was in history books. Uh, and it was only uh, four years later when Speaks wrote his book that he admitted that he had lied. He had made up the words. Reagan had not said a single word. And his reason for doing it he said, well, I was trying to reflect his thoughts, not his words. And he thought that Gorbachev's quotes were better than Reagan's. So he made up quotes from Reagan to try to match it. That, that puts him easily as, as the, uh, the worst one. I mean, how do, you, I mean how, do you, how do you balance, I mean, that kind of lie about a historical event versus, you know, Sean Spicer the crowd, and the crowd size um, lie? I mean, do you, do you see those type of things as... Uh, as he quote. Well, the advantage with Sean Spicer is we knew when he was saying it, that it was a lie. Uh, we know when uh, the current press secretary stands up there and says, President Trump always tells the truth. We know immediately that that's not the truth. We didn't know for four years uh, about uh, Speaks making it up. And it was a matter of real import, uh, not just to us, but to the world. Okay, so I mean, I think um, you know, a lot of the public, I think, is jaded and cynical and tend to believe that all politicians lie, and therefore they probably think that all press secretaries lie. Um, is it is it really unusual that a press secretary will directly lie to you? I mean, do they always fudge it in some way? And so is this is this active a, a, lie? A, a good one does not lie. The uh, I mean, Jody Powell once admitted that he told an untruth about troop movements. Uh, and frankly, people sort of understood that he's not gonna stand up there and tell us when uh, an invasion is, is going to begin. Uh, but no, a good press secretary does not lie. There, one, one press secretary told me there are about 40 ways of saying no comment, and I know them all. Uh, <laughs> can, can I make one other quick point? Sure. Uh, Paula talked about the access that we have 
to, uh, to the president and, and the many times he takes questions. But there's an important distinction. The way President Trump does it, he is in complete control. When, when we're jammed together on the South Lawn and the uh, Marine One is making noise, he can dodge a question and then step five feet away and we can't hear him, he can't hear us. He's in complete control. If you have a press conference in the East Room, he's not in control. Uh, if he doesn't ask a question, it's obvious to everybody. Everybody hears it. You can ask a follow-up. And if he dogs your follow-up, your colleagues will ask follow-ups. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we get away from this notion of just taking questions on the South Lawn and get back to uh, something a little more uh, organized. Okay, well, let me, um, we have some questions coming in. I'm gonna to turn to those in just one second. But since we were talking about lies here right now, um, Tyler, in, in our producer in the background, if you could pull up the, the Washington Post fact checker slide for me. Um, I just want to talk about lies and the word, word lies. Uh, the Post, as of this morning, has Trump at 23,035 false or misleading claims. Some journalists readily use the word lie and others are much more circumspect. circumspect. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of you this, but let me start with Paula. I mean, what do you think of the word lie? Is that, is that, should that be used? Is that something that, that you at CBS use? And kind of more broadly, do you think the, the fact checking that journalism uh, has been engaged in the last you know, couple of administrations is effectively serving our readers and viewers or is it just basically hardening them into their own silos? So thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so I have a lot of bosses and I just have one, I have a lot of bosses and um, I've had some pretty intense exchanges uh, with the president um, and in subsequently trying to summarize what happened there, using the term uh, lies is something that our standards and practices group uh, is very careful about. They believe that that uh, implies intent. I may have been a little more aggressive or a little more forward leaning. I think it's my lawyer brain. I see everything mm -hmm. through a legal lens, um, but they, they were uh, not as quick to use that phrase. Instead, they often say uh, without evidence, uh, or false statements, and uh, it's it's their call. So we, we have not used, uh, he lied, um, even for something like Veterans Choice and saying that he started that or taking credit for that. Uh, even when we gave him the opportunity to explain why, um, he, he that was that was not something uh, that we were able to, to label a lie based on our, our news standards and our, our news practices department. And um, how about the, you know, the, the current false or misleading statements about you know, I won the election, or, you know, there's, there's no question I could have won Georgia. Have you been using the L word in the last couple of weeks? No, instead, what we've been doing is we have been, um, we've been looking at the court cases, we've been sort of pinning it on the judges, you know, judges have dismissed these, these claims, because they're not able to present uh, any, any evidence. So we tend to use uh, the certified results, uh, as they've been certified, and then also uh, the court record, Instead, and again, that's a, that's my my employers and my my many bosses have had a lot of thoughtful discussions about that, and that's where they came down. Okay, Francesca, how about you? I mean, you've been in with a couple different news organizations during this administration, the Daily Mail, and then uh, McClatchy. You know, give us tell us your thinking on lie and the use of it, and has that evolved from from outlet to outlet or over time? So I'm gonna pick up on something George said too about press secretaries. You know, George, you mentioned Josh Ernest. Uh, he, he would famously get around things, by the way, by saying somebody who, as in if we ask if someone's about to step down or if the president's about to appoint someone and he didn't wanna answer the question, uh, but didn't wanna give us untruthful information, it was always, well, that person is somebody who, and then he would move on. And in the current administration, what we often hear is that they haven't spoken to the president about exactly the thing that we were asking about, or they're not aware of that. So that even if it is something that's happening, uh, they're not aware of that. And that's where I've really seen it trend more recently. As far as the word why goes, this is very different as Paul was touching on for each individual for each individual news organization. And it, it does speak a lot to intent. And it's the same reason in, in journalism school, really, they stressed that when someone says they believe something or they trust something, that we always 
precede that with the word said, because I can't possibly know what's going on, what their motivation is, whether they do believe that, whether they do have those feelings about something and what their motivation for saying something is, whether the president really believes, for instance, the things that he's saying, or if he is falsely saying those things and intentionally falsely saying those things, it's just not possible to know that. Uh, regardless of what you may think about it personally. And so what we have done where I work currently is we, we say things like unfounded, uh, without evidence. And as Paula said, we point out facts immediately afterwards that, that contradict what the, the president has said. Okay. Has anybody, I mean, you know, some news organizations have been, you know, far more uh, liberal in the use of the lie word. I've, has, have any of your news organizations kind of been those? Uh, my sense is, well, Anita? No, we're pretty much the same as Francesca and Paul said. Uh, we say without evidence or falsely stated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't actually know if that's sort of a newsroom wide thing, but for my editors on the White House, we we say it that way. Particularly, I've written a lot about even before the election, before election day, about voting by mail. Um, and so what we would say is we would sort of say what he said and then talk about what what the evidence actually showed. So the evidence doesn't show that it's uh, you know, that there was fraud or large, you know, examples of fraud. So it's sort of explaining it, but that's actually kind of tough too, because you have to explain it in a short way. And, and then sometimes you hear from readers who say, look, you're not, you're not going into it well enough. You're not saying that it is a lie and explaining it more. So it's, it's tough to do, to do that, but we haven't really used lie either. Okay. So let me, um, let me take one of our questions from one of our, one of our viewers. This is from Alexander Ward, who is at Vox. Um, uh, I mean, let me, let me throw this one to Margaret because you are a, a former president of the White House Correspondents Association as George also was. Um, and, uh, but the question is, what's the best piece of advice for a first time White House correspondent? Most important do's and don'ts. Great question. Uh, I guess I would probably pick a few things. It's hard to pick the one most important thing. Um, I, I think, uh, listen, when you're engaging with somebody, listen to their answer, take good notes. Um, trust but verify, sounds obvious. It's always a good rule, it remains a good rule. And don't just verify uh, from one place. You know, If you're covering the White House, often your best sources are people outside the White House, right? You have sources on Congress, sources at the Pentagon, sources at the State Department, um, sources at think tanks, people who've been in White Houses before people's political friends, people's political enemies. Uh, very often when you go through the front door, you're not gonna get the answer to the question that you're really seeking. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it just means you shouldn't count on uh, that. That shouldn't be your only um, way in. Teach yourself about history. It's impossible to prepare yourself completely uh, going into a new White House, but uh, there's 365 days in a year and four years in a term and eight years in a presidency at the max. Uh, and that's a lot of time to uh, read uh, the volumes of uh, both history about past presidents and uh, memoirs or biographies by the sitting uh, president, the sitting vice president. Um, always have your eye on uh, what's next, right? Who are the other people who want to be president? How are they positioning themselves? It's just important to see coverage of the White House really not as coverage of a building, but as coverage of a power center. And that power center ex extends from down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol. That power center extends um, to from Washington DC, you know, to Beijing, to Moscow, to um, European capitals and Jerusalem and all sorts of points in between. Uh, so I think taking uh, the context of the moment and the context of the administration and the larger sweep of history um, and, uh, and talking to as many people as you can. The one parting bit of advice I would give is uh, if you're coming in to coverage of a White House, always get to know people like George Condon because it is the people, because like honestly, there are peers and then there are peers. Someone who's been covering the White House for 40 years is not your peer. They're not competing against you. They're at a different place in their careers and they wanna help you like everyone who has um, been through an administration, wants to help teach the next generation of reporters um, anything that can help them uh, be grounded and do a good job of informing the public, which is really what we're here for. 
Okay. So um, yeah. So let me let me ask George a question, or I'll ask kind of I'll ask this to all of you. Margaret, you mentioned uh, you know you know reading about reading the historical books that will help put things in context. I mean, does anybody have a suggestion for you know a short reading list of from you know from reporters who have covered the White House from from press secretaries who have done their books after after the fact, or historians who have done a good job of kind of, you know, giving the kind of context that a new reporter would need to know. Anybody have a thought of a book or two you would recommend? Can we start this in the chat also while we're talking verbally? Sure, that'd be good too. Yeah. yeah. I was going to jump in, by the way, Margaret, and say I, I found it quite good to get to know Margaret. <laughs> quite honestly, <laughs> when I first started, your desk, uh, you, you know, was right near mine, and and so was Anita's, by the way. And I, you guys have both been honestly tremendous colleagues who really helped me to learn to do some of those things better. Margaret, you talked about um, about the power, seeing it as a power center, and I think you're right on the money, by the way, for for reporters about how you can get really good at uh, reporting things to a point where you just go to the administration for comment. Like you already know it, you already have the information down. And as specifically, by the way, uh, when you're in a pandemic is a really good example of this. And all you need from them is comment at that point. That's when you've gotten really good at this beat. Uh, and so I think that's an excellent point, but you did ask about books. And so uh, <laughs> one, of our, one of our White House colleagues, John Carl, really wrote a, a tremendous book recently that I've really enjoyed and actually helped me as a reporter to learn to do some, some things better, like ask for, for interviews, even if uh, with people that you think you're not going to get, then ask for them anyway, because you might be really surprised by the people who end up saying yes to your request for an interview. It, it, what is the, the harm in asking for that? And I think that that has been something that's really uh, been helpful to me. But when you asked about history books, I think that also depends on who the president is and what, you know, what kind of previous presidents they're looking to. Each one of them has some sort of a favorite or some, you know, some sort of a person that they're working off of. And those are the historical books that you want to be reading. Okay. Uh, uh, ahead, let me jump in if I can. Uh, the, the first on books, uh, I'm I'm currently uh, writing a history of the White House Correspondents Association, and, and as part of the research for that, uh, I've read every book written by any White House press secretary wow. th through history, and I've actually found those a lot more helpful than presidential memoirs. I mean, with the exception of Ulysses Grant's. Very few of them are well written and worth uh, trudging through, unless you're looking for something specific on uh, on policy. And and let me add one thing to, to Margaret's uh, excellent points on on the White House beat. I would add one other thing, and that is treat people at the lowest levels uh, decently. I'm I'm always amazed when I see people, you know kind of be rude to drivers or people who handle your bags or lowest level people on, on press. And it's worth remembering Bill Clinton's first job in politics was driving a car for Senator Fulbright. Uh, and I can go through a long list of people who ended up as White House chief of staff or chief policy advisor who started out handling bags and, uh, and riding buses and so on. So. It, it not just because it's a decent thing to do, but it also pays off long term. Okay, so thanks, and I see you all are, are putting some books into the chat function. We will, um, we will, we will gather all of those. Uh, Margaret is instructing everybody to read every Carol book, each one of them being you know about a thousand pages long. So you've you've just uh, you've just booked your next four years. Um, but we'll we'll make a list of those books and have those as part of our resources after the fact. Um, I have a question um, from Nancy Kamal, who is with the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the United States. Uh, this is a fairly broad one, so um, uh, if somebody can grab this if they want, but do you think that the journalist and the media did an adequate job in holding truth to power, or did many back away so as not to be shut out by Trump? I mean, this is an access question. I mean, are the risks of, or the, are the needs of access, did that cause people to to pull back. Does anybody have thoughts on that? I don't feel like even going like really to the max on some of these questions, I don't feel like that ever cost us access. Are we going to get the one-on-one -on -one interview that maybe, you know, Newsmax got? Uh, no, 
but that was one thing that I thought was pretty remarkable is it's not like you're losing much if the press office is not at you for a couple of weeks. I mean, they don't have a lot of information anyway. Um, so I didn't actually find access journalism to be as much of a thing in this administration as it was in the prior. Okay. Um, all right, so we got a question here from, got a question here from Richard Ward. Uh, what is the feedback loop between the reporters and the public? How does what interests the public impact what you seek to report? Um, may, what, Francesca, I'd, I'd be curious to hear you talk about that, particularly since you've, you've moved within news organizations with very different audiences. I mean, um, you know, uh, just describe for us the Daily Mail and McClatchy, kind of who your audiences were, and did did the you know did did your did your readership kind of have what kind of influence did it have on what you're reporting? Sure. Sorry, this is a delay there a second because you got me so excited about the books. There was like seven more I wanted to put, so I've also put them in chat for for anyone else who would like to know what my reading list is like. Um, but as far as the different audiences go, yes. It, so when I was working for DailyMail.com, you know. This is important distinguishment. It's based in New York, based in the United States. And so we were writing for, you know, Americans everywhere. Um, but when you're writing for McClatchy, which is a, a national newspaper company, then we're also writing for individual audiences where we have major papers like the Charlotte Observer or the Kansas City Star, which by the way is where I'm from is Kansas City, uh, the Sacramento Bee, the Miami Herald, places like that. And so you're always writing with an intent of, okay, is this going to matter to readers in those areas? Sometimes we take on specific stories because the individual is from that area. So in this administration, for instance, we had a lot of focus on Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State because he, uh, you know, has the Kansas connection. And Mark Meadows, for instance, um, as well as Mick Mulvaney, because Mulvaney was from South Carolina, where McClatchy has a number of papers. Meadows from North Carolina, where McClatchy has a number of papers. So certainly uh, those sort of things factor in for me, I think, in a way that they may not for other reporters who are just simply and strictly writing for a national audience. Um, I would also say, you know, the, the great thing about being in McClatchy for the, the, the last year of this administration is it's given me a really great opportunity to really dig down into some of those policies. When you're doing the day-to-day -day of everything, it's very, very, it was very, very hectic, at least under President Trump, when he can tweet anything at any time. It often felt like I'd start a policy story and then it would just <laughs> totally get blown up. I'd never be able to come back to it. And so that was a big difference Moving to McClatchy, my job is to do really the enterprise, sometimes with scoops, 30,000 foot sort of thing. I've really been able to dig down into uh, the policies of this administration. We'll be able to continue doing that. So to your point, some of it has just been based on role uh, when I changed when I changed between those two White House jobs. Chris, okay. can I just... Um, so, um, Margaret, go. I just want to say that I do think one of the real challenges is the stratification of audiences and this kind of um, people choosing, um, tuning out entire sectors of the media and, and difficulty if you are a mainstream reporter working for a mainstream outlet in reaching all Americans, right? Uh, this just, uh, there used to be play, there used to be um, broad swaths of the TV landscape and the print landscape that uh, all Americans across partisan lines and economic subgroups and, uh, and such all agreed on as a place to get news. And increasingly things are segmented. There are so many choices. And even, even the outlets that um, uh, assiduously seek out to have no partisan slant, um, even so they're just, everyone's got kind of a shrinking share of audience uh, because there's so many different places you can choose. And I think one of the real challenges for um, mainstream news reporters who do not have any kind of an ideological agenda and their agenda in terms of covering American politics, politics is to inform people about what's going on, uh, that it is, it's a challenge to reach everybody who you're trying to inform. Um, you do not, if you are a mainstream news reporter, you do not have a certain audience in mind uh, that you are exclusively trying to reach, nor do you have a group that you don't care about reaching. You wanna reach everyone. Uh, but if you look at uh, polling, survey research, market research, you understand how difficult that is to do. And I think it is part of the reason that there are these discussions inside of newsrooms. Do you wanna use the word lie if the word lie is going to alienate an entire swath of people or have those people already been alienated? You know, what, 
what is the fact that you're trying to convey? Are you trying to convey someone's intent or are you just trying to convey the information that what a person has said is not factual or is not supported by facts? And so this quest to appeal to as broad an audience as possible in terms of the fact that you are a good faith purveyor of news meets a real challenge with the modern media landscape between technology and branding and self-selection and uh, political polarization. There are just real challenges in, in reaching um, the general public. And this is a challenge that the media faces. This is a challenge that politicians face when they're trying to uh, talk to all Americans. How many different uh, interviews do you have to hit to reach all Americans? If you're in corporate America, if you're in corporate PR and you're trying to brand your, uh, you know, your, the company that you represent or your campaign for whatever uh, to all Americans, how do you hit them? So this is not a challenge that is unique to journalism. But for purposes of this conversation, I think it is a real challenge. It's not just who is your audience, but who do you want your audience to be, and how do you how do you expand that? How do you um, is there a way to change the national dialogue so that there is more um, trust and desire to go outside of of the kind of media comfort zones that that people have self selected for themselves? Okay, well, uh, Tyler, if you could pull up the chart on bias for me. Um, you know, I want to kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, the, this accompanying chart is from the Pew Research Center. It's from a couple of years ago. The key takeaway is just look at the blue lines and the red lines. It's, it's, showing, it's showing the gap widening. And this is basically the, the gap from Republicans, conservative, Republicans and um, Democrats, liberals and conservatives about, you know, how biased they think the media is, how much trust they have in the media. And it's, you know, it's, it got worse from 2016 to 2017, and it's gotten worse since then. And I think it's probably at a kind of a high right now. Um, Paula, maybe if you could start with this one. I mean, how do you how do you report in this environment when you know such a wide swath of the com the country kind of you know thinks that you you know you are not trying to operate in good faith. Well, you just have to stick to the facts. And one thing that can be challenging is, for example, in network news, my opportunity to convey facts is pretty tight. Um, maybe two minutes in the morning, maybe 90 seconds in the evening news. The upside of that is the audience is pretty massive. It's you know, upwards of 5 million people um, on, a, on a given show, uh, depending on which show you're on. That's a brutal arbiter of which facts uh, you can include. And yeah, sometimes people will tweet and they'll say, why didn't you include that he said this or include this? It's a, it's a team effort. It's not easy, but you have to hug the facts. And sometimes, especially right now, uh, the facts uh, are uncomfortable. That's why I really prefer to, to, to report on legal issues because there's always a document, uh, there's always a witness, right? There's at least things that you can pin on what people put in, uh, in court documents, what they say uh, under oath, because here uh, at the White House and in politics in general, uh, it can be challenging because oftentimes people can just say whatever they want. It's your job to try to bring it, bring it back to the facts. But I mean, the idea that there's a political agenda, it's just, it's just not true. What is true is sometimes 90 seconds is tough to tell every single side uh, of, of whatever the issue is. Okay. Anybody else have thoughts about this? You know, I think historically unique moment we're at with this incredible partisan partisan divide in readers and viewers? I mean, how do you, how do, is it possible to work around that? And, or will it take, you know, kind of a generation to kind of get back to a point where people think the media are operating in good faith? Anybody, George, want to tackle that one? Well, I, you start with, you can't worry about whether or not people like us. Uh, nobody goes into journalism, so everybody's gonna like them. Uh, you, you're gonna write stories that are uncomfortable. Uh, you're not necessarily just writing good news stories. Uh, you, you, you're writing about things that people don't wanna always uh, face. Uh, so popularity isn't, isn't a factor. Uh, you do have to worry about our credibility. Uh, and, you know, that's taken a beating in the last four years. It, there is a toll when the president of the United States borrows Joseph Stalin's phrase and keeps calling us an enemy of the people. That sinks into a lot of his uh, people. How, 
how we combat that, uh, I don't have a great answer other than just make sure that our stories are, uh, are accurate and fair. Uh, somebody else probably has a better answer, but th there has been a price paid. Okay. Well, it's, um, it's, uh, it's about five minutes until two. We'll, we're, we're scheduled to go till two or a couple of minutes past, if any of you. Um, we'll try to get some more questions in here. Um, this one uh, from Amy Sherman of Politif PolitiFact. Um, and uh, maybe Anita, if you could tackle this one for me. Uh, looking ahead to covering Biden, what is your advice on how to get administration officials to answer questions on the topics they don't want to answer or to explain what Biden meant when he said something that's unclear? I mean, what are your reporting strategies to get, you know, to kind of get clarity from the White House? That is a great question. It is tough. I think I would start with um, sort of how I start with everything. And Margaret touched on this, which is it's very important to get some information and to do that at the White House. Oftentimes you have to go to other people. So I think there's this misperception that covering the White House means you'll be in the building. Of course, these days we're not, but you're in the building and then people just walk up and talk to you. Um, you know, that's just really not the case. And so I would say find out as much as you can um, before you go to the White House, really, which, you know, could be from lobbyists or activists or associations or think tanks or, you know, staffers on Capitol Hill. So if I'm covering um, immigration, for example, and I, I cover a lot of immigration, you know, I will go to other people bef and gather information before I go to the White House and say, you know, this is what I'm working on. Now, I would love it if they uh, would say to me, hey, you know, we can tell you more about that. And that has happened before. But that's because I already said, look, I'm writing this and here's what I know and what I what I think is happening. And so, um, you know, they're going to say, OK, she does know something and then maybe sit down and talk. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes they don't. But I would just, you know, sort of remember the idea to go outside of the White House to get information to start with. Um, but it is tough. And, you know, sometimes people are going to, uh, you know, answer questions and sometimes they aren't. And I think that's just something you have to know going in that it, it's OK if they don't. Um, if you can get that information from elsewhere. I think George had something he wanted to say. Yeah, uh, uh, if I can just follow, sure. what you just made an excellent point. Uh, you know, the, the best White House correspondent that I ever saw was Ann Devroy of the Washington Post. And I, and I learned something from her. She said, you know, everybody's always frustrated when they come over from Capitol Hill because at Capitol Hill, you can walk up to a member of Congress and they talk to you. Uh, at the White House, we're sequestered in, in a, you know, in a, in a restricted area. You can't just walk up to the chief of staff in his office and, and ask questions. Uh, she made the point that most of her stories did not come out of the building. They came from her sources among lobbyists. They came from Capitol Hill. Even though she was covering the White House, she talked to a lot of members of Congress and a lot of lobbyists. And that was how she was breaking stories. Okay. So thank you, George. So we have time for a few more questions. Um, uh, this one is from Matt Small of WTOP here in Washington. Um, what are your thoughts on how to cover Trump's anticipated criticism of the Biden administration after January 20th? Um, does anybody have, anybody have thoughts on that one? Or I'll ask Paula for her thoughts on it. Sure. I mean, look, he's going to be a force in the Republican Party. We saw late last week, uh, it was just a few dozen Republicans were willing to, to yes, say on the record that uh, Joe Biden is the president-elect. That tells you uh, how, in part, how large he's going to continue to loom uh, once he leaves the White House. So I think the way you cover him um, is as a force in the Republican Party, but you don't cover him um, as as you know, the same way you did when he was a president. And there'll have to be discussions, you know, certainly inside our newsroom about how to cover any events that he holds. I would be surprised if we sent, for example, correspondence. We might send some junior one-man bands just to have an editorial presence there. But he's not going away. Um, and he's certainly going to, to be an unusual uh, former president, because obviously uh, they usually uh, tend, to, tend to be quiet or don't criticize uh, their success are not likely to be the case here, but he's going to be a force in American politics. And that's something that we can't just ignore. 
And I just want to just chime in here. It's sure. such a great question. And I think all these newsrooms, including my own, is having a discussion on what, how to, how to treat him. But there's one really um, different situation, maybe, possibly, which is he's not going to be Barack Obama after eight years. One, one because he's going to be out there talking more. But he may run for president again, right? That's the big difference to me personally is, does he declare that he's running for president? Of course, he may not go through with it. But we treat presidential candidates different than we treat former presidents. He happens to be a little bit of both. So I don't know that there is an exact answer yet, but I would just say that if if he does declare and run that he's running for president again, it's a different issue. It's exactly what Paul is talking about. He's a force of the Republican Party, uh, perhaps a future candidate, future leader. So we have to really think about that, too. OK, um, I do have uh, since you all seem very kind of excited about the uh, the book recommendations. I do have another uh, question on books. Um, you could just stick the answers in the chat if you like, and we will um, we will make those available. Or I'll, I'll do something to kind of make you know if there's a consensus on there. But the question is, which book on Trump's administration is the most interesting and informative? If you all have some thoughts on that, stick it in the chat, and we'll gather those things up. Uh, just have time for a couple more questions. Uh, this is from uh, Justin Margolis. Um, and it's, it's about uh, the uh, gaggles in front of Marine One. While the administration can point to record press availability, one of President Trump's favorite methods is chopper talk gaggles in front of Marine One. Do you think Biden will continue with spontaneous availabilities minus the helicopters, or will he stick with pre-planned conferences, uh, press conferences? Um, I mean, Anita, you and I were talking a little bit about what the Biden administration might look like. Do you have a sense of you know, will he do these spontaneous ones, the driver ones, the, the the helicopter ones? I don't think he'll do the helicopter ones. I mean, that's very, it's just a really difficult situation, hard to hear. As George says, it's, it's designed to put the president in control. I do think that once coronavirus is over, I think things will change a little bit. Before then, I think it's going to be very very scheduled and it's not going to be impromptu events. After coronavirus, I mean, Joe Biden does like to uh, talk to people. He does like to be out there. And I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I think nothing is going to be like like with President Trump. And I do think it's going to change a lot after coronavirus. And Anita, I would just like to add, too, that you know we have seen Joe Biden take shouted questions from reporters from time to time, even as you know, president-elect as a candidate on the sidelines. And that's another way in which this has really changed under the Trump administration. And I don't see it going back entirely is that that, that is now a venue that reporters have that just was, and George can probably speak to this, just wasn't really done before under Obama. And it's something that's done under Trump and, and reporters do it now. And it's provided opportunities to, to get you know, questions in on news of the day, because unfortunately, when you're only having a news conference, you know, once a week, or sometimes even fewer than that, there's so many things that come up in that amount of time that you want to be able to ask a, a president. And so just having those, those quick opportunities has been really, really helpful when there's so much happening in the world. Yeah, also, real quickly, we, we can't let this opportunity pass without lobbying for one thing. One of the worst things that happened in the Trump administration was not just killing White House briefings, but killing Pentagon briefings and State Department briefings. And uh, we need to pressure uh, the new administration to get those briefings back and answer questions. I mean, how did the, uh, Mar Margaret, let me go to, to this one with you. And then I think we just have time for one more question. But uh, I mean, how, how did the briefings change over time um, I mean, I, there was a there was a time where there was there was a very long gap with no briefings at all. Um, I mean, th is that something that changed with press secretaries, or um, or is it was it not tied to the press secretary? And how does it how does how does the daily press briefing compare to what with what it was like, you know, on previous administrations? Yeah, I think um, you've seen over time. Sorry, my, the Q and A thing popped up. I'm just going to shrink it. Uh, I think we've seen over time, and, and McCurry, as George knows, has talked about this too, whether putting the uh, briefings on TV permanently changed the character of them. But um, we've seen over time, in the Obama years, those briefings would get really long. And then in the uh, Trump years, when the briefings were held, the questions were uh, much shorter, much less give and take, and much less using a mechanism of just jumping to the next question 
to cut the reporter off rather than having that kind of more traditional give and take of the Q&A. Um, and I think part of that um, may be uh, a reflection of the time and the moment and kind of the uh, Twitter moment and the soundbite moment, but part of it certainly had to do with uh, the president watching um, the, those briefings himself, which is not like the norm, like, it's not like Obama was sitting around watching the press briefings every day, you know, it just wasn't. Um, and so uh, I think that um, to the extent that there would be a change, uh, and I think there will be a change, uh, but uh, I think you could expect, look, everything we know about not just Biden, but about the people that the president-elect has chosen to surround himself with and to have speak for him is a desire to return to normalcy, whatever that means, and a desire to return some sense of civility, some sense of um, public debate where you can have some airing of disagreements without it being a loyalty test or a patriotism test or that sort of thing. And so I think there will be a concerted effort by the incoming administration to show the public that face. And one of those mechanisms may be through a briefing. I think because of COVID, we don't really know yet um, how robust that uh, like sort of in the room briefing dynamic can be in those early months. So I think as Anita and Francesca have kind of referred to, we're gonna see probably kind of a two phase phase into the incoming administration. And one is between um, inauguration day and broader vaccinations and then two is um, from that point forward. And I think that may guide a lot of the optics and a lot of the public facing engagement uh, that Americans will see between how the a Biden White House and the press corps interacts. This is a question from Paul Hughes Cromwick. How do you keep your emotions out of it, especially um, when if the folks are not particularly likable um, and if they're insulting you all the time. I mean, you've been, been, there's been four years in which the White House from the podium, from the president are basically insulting either you personally or your outlets or media in general on the campaign trail specifically and, on, and during uh, speeches, you know, the press is being booed. I mean, how do, you, how do you steel yourself to kind of you know, ignore that, those taunts or those insults? Don't, don't engage. I think that's the big thing. It's not a surprise, particularly when it comes from the president. Um, just don't engage. Don't take it personally. I've had a few run-ins um, with some top White House officials, even, even in front of people. I mean, just screaming, ranting, cursing, getting in your face. You just can't react. And sometimes you do get an apology. And I think sort of compassion and forgiveness is the best way to develop a source to say, yeah, look, you, you have a stressful job. Um, let's forget that ever happened. And let's talk about what, I, what I'm what i interested in. I mean, that's been, that's been my approach to some really, really um, unpleasant uh, interactions. And that's really not even referring to the president, it's referring to the other folks. And is it, I mean, when, when you're in the midst of those, those unpleasant interactions, do you, do you think it's just political theater on their part or are they really, really pissed off at you? Um, I think it's usually the latter, actually. Um, you, you, we have this unprecedented access. A lot of this happens in the White House North Lawn. I mean, you get the occasional um, expletive laden call, but that happened in the previous administration too. Um, you get the opportunity to put them on the spot on the spot about some tough stuff. And as my colleagues mentioned, the president is often watching. They know he's going to see this, and sometimes they get really ticked off. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you 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 have to just stay professional and focus on the story. All of us have had to write negative stories about somebody that we personally liked. That that doesn't enter into it. Uh, I've covered eight presidents, and guess what? I haven't liked all all of them. Uh, but that doesn't at all affect how you uh, how you write. But did they like you, George? Oh well, that's probably unanimous on the uh, downside. But.